atmosphere. So this whole chamber is built in such a way that we can control ions inside it and uh, we will be able to reveal for the first time how important ions are in the production of forming new aerosols and in the end new clouds. The motivation for doing this experiment has uh, really been uh, trying to understand why there seems to be this relation between solar activity and climate on Earth. All this uh, political turmoil that is surrounding uh, global warming and so on is irrelevant for the, uh, the science. And the kind of experiment that we are doing, I think it's a necessary uh, experiment because it will uh, improve our understanding on one of the most important processes in the atmosphere, which is uh, cloud formation. Originally, I got interested uh, in the topic when a colleague of mine uh, in Germany asked me what are the effects of supernovae on life on Earth. And I decided to give him a serious answer. I, what I did, I uh, looked at uh, the literature and eventually uh, stumbled upon uh, Henrik Svensmark uh, results about uh, cosmic rays and cloud cover. So I realized that uh, if this uh, hypothesis is correct, that uh, cosmic rays affect cloud cover and climate, what it would mean is that also uh, variations which don't originate from the sun, but also variations from the whole Milky Way, they too will affect climate on Earth. Ever since I was a kid, I was uh, interested in astronomy. That's why I became an astronomer. I never realized as a kid, I mean, I always appreciated uh, this Milky Way, the fact that you can go out in a dark uh, night and see this beautiful uh, galaxy that we're inside of. It is something that we actually live in. It's part of us and it's affecting us. It's affecting the uh, climate here on Earth. And you must take it into uh, account, into consideration, if you want to understand past variations uh, in the climate. What's fascinating is that this Milky Way, which looks something which is very far away, it isn't very far away. We are part of it. And this link between this Milky Way and us is cosmic rays. The solar system moves in and out of the spiral arms. And the spiral arms are the regions where you have the new stars. And the new stars is also some of them, the heavy stars that live very shortly and explode in supernova. That means that you have more cosmic rays as you move in to the um, uh, spiral arms. If we look at the Milky Way from the top, what we'll see are four spiral arms, and that's because the Milky Way is a spiral arm galaxy. So we have four, four spiral arms. We are located here on some small armlets. We are rotating around the sun once every year, but the whole solar system rotates around the Milky Way once every about 250 million years. That's one galactic year. What this means is that every 150 million years, when we pass through a spiral arm of the galaxy, it's colder by uh, something of order 5 degrees or 10 degrees. When we're outside of the spiral arm, it's hot. Now we're on this uh, small spur, so we're witnessing cold weather. When we enter a spiral arm of the galaxy, we are going to witness more uh, cosmic rays reaching the Earth, more atmospheric ionization, more uh, cloud condensation nuclei, and therefore more low-altitude clouds, or to be more uh, precise, whiter low-altitude clouds, which better reflect the sunlight and cool the Earth. So the bottom line is that when we enter a spiral arm of the galaxy, we should expect lower temperatures. A hundred million years ago, these cliffs were part of the floor of a warm ocean. Earth back then was between spiral arms of the galaxy. 
all over the earth it was uh, much warmer. We had uh, dinosaurs sunbathing in Alaska or in Antarctica. About uh, 70 million years ago, uh, we started uh, approaching and entering the uh, Sagittarius uh, spiral arm and Earth became exposed to a higher flux of cosmic rays because of all the stars uh, around us. This larger flux of cosmic rays was responsible for the formation of uh, more clouds and colder conditions here on Earth. The uh, ice sheets that uh, later formed, they actually pushed all those cliffs uh, out of the water like bulldozers and they uh, rippled the landscape. So what we see here in these cliffs is a good example for hot conditions on one hand when those cliffs were formed and a cold ice house conditions which we have today which are responsible for the uplifting and uh, current conditions of this, these cliffs. It may sound strange to most people that we're talking about ice house conditions today, but if you look on the long time scale, you find that during most of Earth's history, we didn't have any ice caps whatsoever. Today we have. 450 million years ago, we had a very cold conditions here on Earth. However, we had more than 10 times as much CO2 in the atmosphere. So clearly CO2 is not a major climate driver, at least it wasn't a major climate driver then. When we talk about climate changes on these timescales, it is a kind of climate change that is much, much more dramatic than anything we have seen uh, in, our, in our history. When we are in between spiral arms, it looks as if we are in a warm period called a hot house, and most of the ice is simply melted, there's no, no ice at all. When we are in the spiral arms, uh, half the area of the Earth is simply covered with ice. And the changes in climate, I mean, are much, much more dramatic than anything we have seen recently. Over the past uh, billion years, Earth has passed through uh, periods when it was cold and periods during which it was uh, hot. And lo and behold, the periods during which it was cold synchronize with the astronomical data which tells us when we should have passed through spiral arms of the galaxy. At some point, I realized that you can actually uh, reconstruct the cosmic ray flux and you can do it with these things, with the iron meteorites, because iron meteorites, after they break off their uh, asteroids, they are exposed to cosmic rays and they record the cosmic rays in the solar system over hundreds of millions of years. And what you find is that this cosmic ray flux changes exactly as you would expect from the astronomical data on one hand, and it also changes exactly in sync with the uh, climate variations that you can uh, reconstruct using geological uh, records. I've been working almost all my, all my life on uh, issues related to the uh, environment. And of course, one of the biggest and biggest problems and issues was and what was the climate and how the uh, temperature of the seawater changed. And we worked on the fossils like this, called, called brachiopods. These shells record the temperature of the past oceans. When they form, they reflect the temperature of the ocean water because they build in uh, the atom of oxygen, then you could measure this proportion of uh, oxygen and you could get a measure of the temperature of the past oceans and then that means of the temperature of the earth and climate. So when we can measure this, we would get a record of ocean temperature for 500 million years. When I look at the data, I realized that actually there were some oscillations in the, the general trend of temperature and that those oscillations fitted quite well with what we knew from geology, what kind of a climate was at that time. Working with the, with the colleagues, we did an evaluation and statistical study of that, and we saw that there was some kind of a periodicity roughly over about 140 million years, switching back and forth between hot house and ice house. Okay. 